Good morning, James. Good morning, Tessa. Do we see Mayor Wells as an attendee yet? Not yet. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Hello. Hi. Yes, how are you? Um, let me check on that. Uh, I think someone said he's not going to join. Okay. He doesn't have the internet in his house. In battle. So, so hopefully Oceanside's representative will. Uh, Mayor Bill Wells, I see that you've joined. Can you give us a sound check by unmuting your mic? Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you very much. Great. That's it. All right, let me let me get back into this thing and let these guys know. All right, wait. Now we just hit. We are connected. We clicked raise our hand, and it looks like they raised our hand or allowed us to speak. Can you guys hear us? Yes, we can. Councilman Jack Feller, okay. University of Yeah. Okay, so you have to Okay, so they're going to cut us off though, as far as the mute. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. We can hear you loud and clear. Good morning, Deputy Mayor Feller. I'm glad to see you're on with us this morning. Mayor Solis, go ahead. You had your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to triple check that everything is a go on my end. You can hear me and hope everybody's having a fabulous morning today. Mayor, thank you very much. Loud and clear. If 
Vice Chair Blake's here. I see your hand up. Um, it says you're self-muted. If you go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Give us a sound check, please. Good morning. It's Catherine. Just checking in. Good morning. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Member Benelli, I see your hand up. You are self-muted. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and give us a, a sound check, please? Uh, this is Gary Benelli. I'm good to go. One, two, three, four, five. Loud and clear, sir. Thank you very much. Council Member Baber, I see your hand up. Do you want to give us a sound check? Good morning. Morning, loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Mr. Joe Stuvison, you had your hand up. Go ahead and give us a sound check, please. Hi, Joe Stuvison on the line. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Is, uh, go ahead. Councilmember Ritter, your uh, hand was raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself and give us a sound check, please. Mayor Ritter, can you hear us? We we cannot hear you. Hello, this is Mary Salas. Do you hear me? Mayor, we hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, because you called Mayor Ritter, but um, I, I'm responding. I had my hand raised for a long time and um, Nobody acknowledged, so I didn't know whether or not I was working or not. Thank you, Mayor Salas. Mayor Minto, you had your hand raised. Go ahead and give us a sound check. Yeah, I'm testing. Um, am I supposed to have any video on this? No, sir. Um, we, are, okay. we are doing a voice over. The, you should be able to see a pre-slide up on the screen right now. Uh, but nobody's video is sharing. Oh, okay. I'm here then. Okay, I'll put you back on mute. Mayor Jones, you had your hand up. Give us a sound check, please. Hello, Rebecca Jones, San Marcos. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Supervisor Jim Desmond, you had your hand up. Go ahead and give us a sound check, please. Uh, good morning. Just check it in. Jim Desmond. Thank you very much, sir. Loud and clear. Mayor Solis, you had your hand up again. Good morning. After I did my sound check, I hung up. So I'm doing a triple, quadruple check this all as well. But uh, hope all is going good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Loud and clear. Go ahead and give us a sound check, please. Good morning. Can you give us, can you try that again? Your your mic was a little bit uh, 
garbled there. Is this better? Yeah, it's much better. Thank you very much. Great. Member Lynch, you had your hand up. Can you give us a sound check, please? Good morning. Uh, this is Yung Park Lynch for North County Transit District. Thank you very much. Loud and clear. Mayor Ritter, you still have your hand up and you're self-muted. You want to get unmute and give us a sound check, please? Supervisor Gaspar, um, your mic is self-muted. Go ahead and unmute yourself and give us a sound check, please. Hi, good morning, Supervisor Gaspar here. Thank you very much, loud and clear. Mayor Ritter, you just need to click the icon, the microphone icon one time. It will not turn green until James unmutes you after you unmute yourself. Can I please ask all staff members to please mute yourself? We can hear someone in the background. Thank you.
The Sandag team, are we ready to roll? Yes, sir. This is James. Here, we are ready to roll. Let's get to it. I want to welcome everybody to our first ever uh, teleconference meeting of the Sandag Board of Directors for Friday, March 27th, 2020. Uh, first, I want to thank staff for the tremendous efforts they've made to uh, pull this together. And, uh, thank you to everybody on the phone and, and web for taking the time to join us today. Uh, with that, uh, we will start uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would uh, invite you to join me. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tessa, do we have a quorum? James, can you Present. unmute Tessa? Present. I'm sorry, Chair. Uh, Tessa, do we have a quorum? Yes, Chair, we have a quorum of 19 of 19 jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Also, because this is a new process for all of us, I'd like to ask uh, John Kirk, uh, General Counsel, to please go over basic instructions for both board members and members of the public to participate today. John? Thank you, Chair Voss. Uh, in today's meeting, if you have a question or a comment, or if you'd like to make or second a motion, uh, as uh, they went through in the training, click on your raised hand icon at the top right of the screen. When the chair sees that, he will call on you. Everyone's microphone will be muted by default. This is important. Don't touch the microphone icon. The chair will be able to see a list of all board members who have raised their hand and will call on you at the appropriate time and you will be unmuted. Your microphone icon at the top right of your screen will turn from red to green when you are unmuted. Again, don't click on the microphone icon yourself. If you mute yourself, we cannot unmute you. After your motion or comments, you will be muted again and the chair will proceed to the next board member in line. For each item on the agenda, the chair will call on staff to present that item. You will see their PowerPoint slides on the screen. You will not see any video of the staff, nor will your video be shared anywhere. After each presentation, we will share our normal, pro we will follow our normal process. If you have a question of the presenters, not a comment, but a question of them, raise your hand and the chair will call on you. We will then take public comment, which will be described in a moment. Board members can then offer comments on the item by raising their hands. As before, the chair will call on members who have raised their hands and unmute each individually. If you would like to make a motion or second a motion on an item, please raise your hand. The chair will recognize you as this in the same manner as for questions or comments, and your microphone will be unmuted at that point, you should identify yourself and make or second a motion. For voting by state law, all votes in a teleconference meeting must be by roll call vote. In order to achieve this, after there has been a motion and a second, the clerk will call for the vote of each jurisdiction individually. That member will be unmuted to vote, should identify yourself and indicate if you are voting yes, no, or yes, no, or abstaining. And at the conclusion of voting, staff will post the result of the vote on the screen in the same manner that you normally see it at our meetings. They are using the voting devices that you normally use to register your vote. And we would ask that you look at those voting results on the screen at the table and make sure that we have entered your vote correctly. If you see that your vote was not entered correctly, please raise your hand and we will correct that issue immediately. Also for clarity of the record, every time you speak, please identify yourself and your jurisdiction. 
As we go through this process, we, go, we recognize that we'll be moving a bit slower than normal, but we hope that we can have a successful meeting nonetheless. For members of the public, we have comments that were emailed to the clerk of the board in advance of the meeting. Those were, that were sent by 4 p.m. yesterday were provided to all members of the board in advance of today's meeting. The public can also email comments during today's meeting as is described on the agenda. Those should be sent to clerk at sandag.org during the meeting, identifying the item number to which the comments pertain and the name of the commenter. After the conclusion of each presentation and after any board questions on that item, we will take any needed time to compile comments that were received on that item. The clerk will then read all comments that were submitted during the meeting on that item. Mindful of the number of items today and the need to keep a quorum, the chair has set a limit of one minute per comment. If a comment takes more than this time to read, only the first one minute will be read, but the entirety of the comment will be made a part of the meeting record. That concludes my instructions. Staff will remain available to assist with any technical issues at the phone number that was provided to board members. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Uh, we will uh, move to public comment. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment to be read into the record? I do not have any general public comments at this time, Chair. Thank you. Then we'll move to member comment. If any board member would like to offer any comments, please write, raise your hand at this time. Uh, I've got uh, Georgette, Council President Gomez. Oh, um, thank you. I erased it earlier, but uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge the work that I know that putting these uh, this new way of uh, engaging as a board and keeping uh, moving the, the the program moving forward is not an easy task. So I just want to acknowledge uh, staff for their incredible work and in putting this all together very quickly. So thank you for that. Thank you, Georgette. Uh, Serge Dedina. You there, Serge? I'm trying to, yeah. Hi, hi, good morning. This is Serge Dedina, Mayor of Imperial Beach. Thanks, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, who's been working across the border with Governor Jaime Bonilla of Baja California to try to get them to adopt some of the restrictions or a lot of the restrictions and measures that California has been taking. Obviously, Mexico's lack of preparation and, and diligence uh, in, in taking care of this issue could have a significant impact on how we interact with the border for some time to come. So I would encourage everyone to reach out to their state legislators and federal legislators to ask them to continue to pressure the State Department and the governor of California to keep continue working with Baja California to get them to adopt more stringent measures so that we can uh, really have some sort of border interaction far into the future. Um, I was on a call with the former director of the CDC yesterday and this, this idea of collaboration across borders on this issue is absolutely crucial, not just for containment, but for recovery, especially if one neighbor is behind another. So. Um, I just wanted to raise that issue. It's obvious, obviously impacts Sandag's capacity to work across the border, but uh, this will be more of an issue as we continue to move forward and identify how we get through this, because we will, um, but also how we recover. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Serge. I see no other hands for member comment. Uh, we'll move on to uh, item number two. Uh, PAC chairs, if you have any uh, reports to offer, if you'd uh, please raise your hands. I see no raised hands for our PAC chairs. Uh, so we will uh, move on uh, to the executive director's report, item number three. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comments on this item? Chair, I do not have any public comments on this item. Okay, Hassan? If we got Hassan for the executive director's report.
Paging Hassan. Tessa or John, do we have uh, Hassan or is he in an undisclosed location? I know he's available. I don't know if he's having technical difficulties. Perhaps we could move forward with a consent agenda when he tries to reconnect and take that item up in just a moment. Okay, uh, we will skip over number three for now and uh, move to consent. If a board member would like to pull any of the items on the consent agenda, or if you have questions or comments on any consent, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Supervisor Desmond. Can we get Supervisor Desmond unmuted? Jim? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I, I, get, I would like to move the uh, consent uh, calendar or consent items. However, I would like to ask on item seven, uh, there are recommendations here from our auditor um, for organizational uh, perform uh, organizational analysis and had comments from management. I'd like this item to actually item seven to come back to the board uh, for possible discussion and action um, when the board is meeting again in in person. So I don't know if that's that's going to be June or July or whenever, but I'd like to move the, the consent with item seven coming back as a discussion and possible action item. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Jones. And is, I'm, I'm just not sure. So when we hired the auditor, I felt that her role was um, to figure out where our efficiencies could be made and that we would be voting on things. So uh, my question was, I'm not sure Am I am I misunderstanding that, or is it that yes, we are supposed to be um, approving her action, and also um, uh, and so I guess I would agree with uh, Supervisor Desmond. I just I just feel like it should be something that we're voting on because that's what her role is. So that's just my 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 two cents. Okay, so that's a second to Supervisor Desmond. Yes, it is. Thank you. Motion yes. to approve, but to also bring back item seven uh, for face to face discussion. Uh, Council President Gomez. Um, I didn't have a question about that item. My hand was raised by somebody else, but I support the motion. <laughs> And uh, yes, uh, I mean, since we are talking about the auditor, what, the way that um, maybe this is as, as it is brought back, uh, one idea is um, when I was part of the audit committee at the city of San Diego, uh, the auditor would create a work plan for the year in areas that they were going to be auditing. I don't know if that's plan of, if that's something that is being created um in, in terms of what what exactly they're going to be doing or are they just going month by month so that 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 would be a question and a request that is whenever the item does come up maybe that can be part of the presentation but i support okay, thanks georgette let me uh, get some clarity perhaps from uh, council member baber Staff, can you unmute Mr. Baber? Bill, can you hear me? Yes, the audit uh, committee has a work plan, um, Georgette, and um, um, it's uh, it's either has come to the full board or will come to the full board um, soon. Um, and the reason I'm glad that Mr. Desmond moved this item is because it got forwarded to you as an information, it probably should have got forwarded to you as a um, discussion item. So I support the motion also. 
Okay, I see uh, Mayor, thanks, uh, Bill. I see Mayor Jones's hand up again. Is that uh, just because you didn't take it down or you wanted to speak again? I didn't take it down. Okay, Am and I Council President, button? sorry. Council President Gomez, your hand is up again. I'm sorry? Your hand was up again, Georgette. Um, no. <laughs> I, okay, uh, no problem. I, no, there's some hand problems here, but no, no question. Thank okay. you. Not a problem. Okay, uh, seeing no further comment, uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment on the consent agenda? Chair, I do not have any public comment for the consent agenda at this time. Thank you. So, uh, seeing no further discussion, quite scanning once more, Georgette's hand wants to come up all by itself. Um, we have a motion from Supervisor Desmond uh, to approve the consent agenda and bring back item seven for face-to-face -face discussion at the earliest opportunity and a second from uh, Mayor Jones. Uh, Tessa, would you uh, please lead the roll call vote? Council Member Schumacher, City of Carlsbad. Can we get Council Corey Schumacher unmuted, please? Aye. Thank you. Mayor Salas, City of Chula Vista. Mayor, yourself muted. Salas, aye. Mayor Bailey, City of Coronado. Bailey, aye. Supervisor Desmond, County of San Diego. Aye. Mayor Haviland, City of Del Mar. Aye for Del Mar. Mayor Wells, City of El Cajon. Mayor, yourself muted. Go ahead. Bill. Mayor Wells, I, I did not register your vote. Bill, you are very, very faint. Bill, for the moment, maybe just raise your hand uh, to signify an eye. Mayor Wells, you are Chair Boss, we can. Go ahead, Tessa. Uh, we can we can always come back to El okay. Cajon. Let's move on. Next on the list. My, my apologies. Vice Chair Blakespear, City of Incident. Yes. Mayor McNamara, City of Escondido. Mayor, you're self muted. Aye. Just a reminder Mayor to everybody. Don't 
don't touch your microphone mute button. They can do it from Mission Control. Mayor Dedina, City of Imperial Beach. Mayor Dina, you are muted as well. Go ahead. Dina, I. Councilmember Baber, City of La Mesa. Aye. Mayor Vasquez, City of Lemon Grove. You are, Mayor, you're also self-muted. Mayor Vasquez, aye. Mayor Sotelo Solis, City of National City. Sotelo Solis, aye. Deputy Mayor Feller, City of Oceanside. Feller, C. Chair Boss, City of Poway. Aye. Council Member Moreno, City of San Diego. Go ahead, Council Member Moreno. Vivian. Vivian. Let's come back to uh, Council Member Moreno. Go ahead, Tessa. Uh, Mayor Jones, City of San Marcos. Sorry, go ahead, Mayor. Mayor Jones, aye. Mayor Minto, City of Santee. Mayor Minto, aye. Council Member Zito, City of Solana Beach. David Zito, yes. Mayor Ritter, City of Vista. Mayor Ritter, you are self-muted. Mayor Ritter, you are self-muted and should be able to unmute yourself. I, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, Mayor Ritter, yes. Chair Voss, uh, Mayor Wells in City of El Cajon is having some technical issues. We're asking staff to call him now. I'd like to call again on Councilmember Moreno with the City of San Diego. Vivian, can you hear us? Perhaps we can make telephone contact with uh, Council Member Marino. Will do. Uh, we have uh, completed the uh, roll call vote then, uh, pending those tech uh, challenges. Mr. Kirk, we're good to go? Yes, sir, we're good to go. All righty. Uh, moving on to uh, reports item number eight, 
uh, has Chair been Boss, pulled by staff. Chair Boss, I'm sorry, this yes. is the clerk of the board. I'd like to announce for the record that the um, item passed with 17 of 19 jurisdictions voting. Thank you. We're going to go back to my report. Moving to uh, item eight, uh, staff has pulled this item. It's going to be heard at a future meeting. Uh, moving on to item nine. Chair. Is somebody speaking to me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the executive director, Hassan, is, we've got his mic resolved. If you would like to go back to the executive director report before moving on. That would be fine. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, then go back to item number three. Uh, Executive Director's report, Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to all of you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much and, and wishing you all uh, health and safety for you and your communities, your loved ones. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Sandag mobilized offers to shift employees from our offices to teleworking as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. As of today, 90% of our employees are teleworking. We closed the downtown office last Monday. The toll operation center is closed to customers, and uh, is closed to customers, but a number of essential employees are continuing to take phone calls and ensure safety and maintenance of the roadway while following social distancing recommendation. Our IT department under the leadership of Jim Despatchow has been responsive and resourceful. And on your behalf, I want to thank them for the amazing work they did to make the agency working again. We have deployed more than 150 laptops to employees who needed them to work from home, and we have more on the way. Every single Sandag employee has pitched in to continue our important work. We'll continue to monitor and follow federal, state, and county guidelines in our efforts to stem the spread of the virus and flatten the curve. I want to update you on a few projects that are important for all of us. First, uh, the 2021 Regional Transportation Plan development. Everything is moving on schedule. I spoke to Supervisor Desmond last week and informed Chairman Vass that the vision presentation that was slated for April 3rd will be moved to May 1st. That will not affect the schedule of moving forward on the plan. If the May 1st doesn't happen, we'll adjust accordingly. Supervisor Desmond Chair Vaz will make a decision accordingly. Uh, so this change will not delay the overall schedule. We can still meet the required deadline to have an approved regional plan by the fall of 2021. Uh, recent news stories have noted that teleworking and the stay at home orders have resulted in reduction in commute related to the greenhouse gas emission. Our hope is many of us, especially many of our employers will continue some of the telecommuting that taking place today. That's definitely gonna make it easier for us to meet our requirements um, and will be good for our system. It's too early to tell, like I told the news reporters, it's too early to tell whether they're gonna last, but we would like to and we're gonna encourage it. As a matter of fact, Sandag has what we call the iCommute program that we're gonna put some resources into to encourage employers to continue these trends. On the airport connectivity and center mobility hub, things are moving as uh, is, the interagency MOU has been approved and work is getting underway to implement it. We are sharing data with our partners, the port, airport, the city of San Diego, and we are looking at the scope of analyzing transportation system improvements that will support the airport's planned expansion. We'll continue our work on NAVOR. I want to thank our partners from the United States Navy I especially want to thank Joe Stuyvesant and his team for the continued partnership. We have a meeting coming up next week with the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and Navy Region Southwest. The Mid-Coast Rally Project, 
and other infrastructure projects are considered essential and work on these projects continuing. For mid-cost, our general contractor, MCTC, has taken measures to ensure and enforce that workers are actively practicing social distancing and ensuring that 10 or fewer workers are participating in job site briefings. Additional hand washing stations were put in place for construction sites. Office staff are working from home. Supervisor work out of their trucks with Wi-Fi hotspots. Crew workers have no passengers in their vehicles and the gloves are required. As uh, Jim Lethicum, the chief deputy for the capital project indicated, Things are moving on schedule. If things change, we will let you know. Obviously, the supply chain um, and material availability will become important, but so far, so good. Some legislative update, as you heard in the news, the Senate passed the two trillion emergency relief funding package. We will uh, be sending you a separate email to detail, but the good news out of that is the funding package includes 25 billion in emergency transit funding, as well as funding for local enforcement and the tribes. Governor Newsom has a daily briefings and said earlier this week that he expects will be another eight to 12 weeks before California can reopen again. Before going into an early recess, the state legislator passed a one billion assistance package, which the governor already had begun to use to relief efforts. The Department of Finance sent a notice out earlier this week to manage expectation of the 2020-2021 state budget. It looks like unlikely that the legislators will reconvene by April 13th, as originally thought. However, we continue to work with Assemblymember Cardi Gloria on our CEQA streamlining bill. Today, you're gonna hear an important item that is the preliminary budget. And you will be hearing a presentation in our draft fiscal 21 budget, but you'll we'll also be hearing from Ray Major on what uh, the expectation and the forecast for the impact of the pandemic on the budget. Let me make it very clear that what the budget today does not reflect what's happening since the pandemic broke. The only thing I want you to know is before uh, the pandemic broke, we anticipated uh, tough times ahead. Uh, I, as I told you uh, the last time we met, uh, we made a decision uh, for, for this fiscal year and next fiscal year not to bring in any employees and to not backfill positions which would result in 10% reduction in the workforce by the end of the fiscal year. That's, that's already reflected in the budget. Additional <laughs> measures are going to have to be taken after we understand, after we understand the full impact of this pandemic, which I believe will not be uh, here for a while. It's going to take us a while to understand the impact. We do have, like our uh, chief counsel will tell you, we do have some uh, bylaws deadlines to meet when it comes to the budget. I believe the bylaw said we have to have something by April 1st. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that uh, we can't miss the deadline if, if you feel. But I want to uh, assure you that this budget will change before you finally adopt it as a result of this pandemic and the impact on our revenues. Uh, Ray Major will give us some insight on what that might mean to transit revenue. Mm -hmm. Staff will use the best forecasting to determine what changes uh, to incorporate in the budget. We know this is a serious time. To be clear, there is no proposed, no new, new proposed position in this budget, a reduction in the workforce by 10% by the end of fiscal year. And I am very much hoping that the impact on revenues is gonna be severe, but that's to be known. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, and I'll be happy to take any questions from any of the members. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, 
scanning for raised hands here. Uh, any board members, uh, Georgette, I see your hand, but I don't know if I trust it. Supervisor, this Please. is James. Uh, we think we've resolved Bill Wells and he's unmuted now. Okay. Uh, Georgette? No, I, no, um, I did not raise okay. my hand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. And I still see Bill Wells is unmuted. Uh, perhaps we can mute him, I don't see a hand raised. Uh, Tessa, do we have any public comment on this item? Chair, we do not have public comment on this item. And Mayor Wells is uh, connected via his phone. So he's having, he, he's not able to raise his hand. He's not able to find that icon, but he should okay. recognize when he's unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, seeing no further comment, uh, we, we will- Mayor Sola. Solis from National City with her hand raised. Ah, my apologies. Alejandra, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Voss. Uh, thank you again, Executive Director Agrada. I think it's uh, you know great that you know we're acknowledging the fact that these are you know times where our revenues uh, will be impacted, and that as a cause we're very um, very much cognizant of what the impact will be on personnel um, as well as you know future uh, dedicated funds to programs um, or to and projects uh, i appreciate the fact that um, hassan mentioned uh, you know uh, the the hiring freeze and uh, the reduction in staff um, and uh, know that we at the cities are also um, you know, very cognizant of uh, what the what the impact will be on our on our general funds. So, uh, with that, uh, you know, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to all of our staff. Um, I hope you all know that we appreciate everything you do, you do, um, and and that we're all we're going to have to cinch our our belts. And uh, but we appreciate everything that you do, and uh, uh, that concludes my concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wells. Can we get Mayor Wells, Wells unmuted? Mayor Wells, you are now muted yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. Okay, I, I I don't have any comment, Chair. I just was listening. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes that item of uh, seeing Supervisor no other hand. Gustavo I'm sorry? From, Supervisor Gustavo from Caltrans would like to speak. I'm, my apologies. Go ahead. Gustavo, you're self-muted. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you, and I apologize. I've been having some technical difficulties. I, I did want to provide the board members a very brief update of, of where Caltrans is at through this uh, crisis, um, so that you know which services may be affecting your, your agencies. Um, as you know, with the executive order um, that came out and, and mandated everybody to shelter in place, there are certain essential activities that are, are exempt, and that includes the transportation system. That is because uh, the highway system is essential to keep the, the, the workers that need to keep working uh, to go where they need to, to keep all, get all the supplies to the uh, Californians that are sheltered in place. So um, basically that means that all of our activities are still ongoing, and that includes construction as well, um, we, we are in contact, uh, constant contact with our partners in industry. And at this time in California, the, the construction industry is willing and able to continue working. But we're monitoring the situation very closely. Um, as of today, uh, one of our partners, Washington Department of Transportation, 
ceased all of their construction activities for two weeks because of interruptions in labor and their supply chain. So that's a situation that we will continue monitoring. But I repeat, for now, all of our construction continues and we continue advertising our projects as well. Um, like many other agencies and Sandeg, uh, we are changing the way we do business. About two thirds of our workforce that works normally in the office are telecommuting. Uh, and our field people uh, continue working in construction and maintenance activities, as I mentioned earlier. We have over 400 field employees every day performing essential services. And one of the things we notice is with less traffic, um, speeds are going up uh, significantly. So we are asking everybody to help us um, follow the speed limit so that our employees can be safe. Um, we have uh, closed our maintenance and construction offices to um, visitors and, and anybody trying to uh, visit our construction or maintenance office should try to call first to try to set an appointment. And for agencies or individuals that need encroachment permits, we are uh, asking everyone to call our encroachment permit office. Um, the process can be done virtually. There is no need, I mean, to the office. And, and they'll, our permit office will walk anybody needing an encroachment permit through the process so that it can get done safely. And similarly, for all your agencies that need help from our local assistance branch, they are working, but we help that we, we try to conduct business through the phone or virtually. Um, so that um, we're we, we also, you've probably seen our changeable message signs, uh, messaging, both regarding um, COVID issues, um, public awareness type issues, as well as uh, restrictions at the border. So we are leveraging our assets as best as we can to, to help spread the message. Uh, and for our transit partners, um, uh, maybe this has been mentioned, but there's obviously uh, huge impacts to our trans transit opera operations in the region. And, and our division of rail and mass transit uh, has sent a letter to all the transit agencies asking them to submit data uh, to a central location so that we can communicate these impacts to state and federal officials. Um, and that may help to look at any programmatic, legal or budgetary relief that may be necessary. So I, I'd like to conclude with that. And if there are any questions or, 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 uh, or, or concerns about the highway system, feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Uh, we are now uh, moving on to uh, item nine, the draft fiscal year 2021 Sandag program budget. Uh, uh, Georgette, I know uh, you had a uh, comment or question on that before it started. Please uh, unmute Georgette Gomez. There you hey, go, thank Georgette. You. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted before staff gave its presentation, and uh, I think Hassan, you alluded during your report, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I actually had difficulty um, allowing this item to move forward, uh, recognizing the 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 crisis that we're currently are dealing with um, in terms of the pandemic and really um, the economic crisis that is tied to it. So I know that we do have bylaws that specify that we need to uh, circulate the, the budget by April 1st. And uh, I, I, I wanted to ask council, and this is just, I don't want us to move forward with the presentation and then and then uh, have these questions. So I wanted to get them at the beginning just to see if if uh, if council can speak to the bylaws under emergency status that we're right now under and uh, declared by the governor, um, if we have any leniency on these bylaws or what do we need to do to really uh, create a different process. But because I just think we cannot ignore the circumstances that we're in right now and economically we're all getting hit. Um, the city of San Diego is reconsidering its budget processing right now just because it, there's a lot of unknowns. 
So if council can speak to the to the bylaws that we currently have. John Kirk, please. Yes, council president, thank you. <clears throat> um, so as you noted, your SANDAG bylaws in Article 6, Section 1, uh, call for the board of directors. Uh, what it says is the board of directors shall approve a pr preliminary budget no later than April 1 of each year, and the board of directors shall adopt a final budget no later than June 30 of each year. And a copy of the preliminary budget when approved and a copy of the final budget when adopted shall be filed with each member agency. Now, the your your board policies do talk about emergencies, but what they deal with with emergencies or what they speak to is really more conferring authority on uh, maybe from the board down to either the chair or the executive director in the event of emergency. There's nothing in the bylaws that or the board policies that specifically excuses compliance with any any mandates such as this in the event of an emergency. That being said, um, if you do not comply with the bylaws in in this respect, we'd have to take a look at what is the potential remedy or what risk do you run at that point. Uh, I would say if you don't comply with the bylaws, a member agency could could bring an action in court to compel you to comply with the bylaws. Um, or probably the other risk is that we want to make sure that we're giving member agencies enough time to comment. I believe that's the purpose of having a preliminary and then a final budget um, to distribute that, allow member agencies to comment. Uh, I believe that that risk could be mitigated by having conversations during this interim involving all member agencies that can happen at the board or otherwise. Uh, for member agencies to be able to comment. But if you did not approve a preliminary budget either today or otherwise before April 1st, we would uh, be failing to meet that mandate of the bylaw. But again, there's, uh, to me, the, the risk of that could be mitigated by continuing to have conversations in the interim before the final budget deadline about the, uh, the contents of the budget. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, let me call on uh, Supervisor Desmond. Let's get him unmuted. There we go. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and um, you know, I agree with uh, uh, Council Pre President uh, uh, Gomez in that you know I had trouble reading this uh, this item as well as far as why are we doing this now. But I, you know, from the from the attorney, it sounds like we don't have a lot of choice. Uh, in here, there was, you know, some increases of about fifty-five million dollars from the what was previously uh, for the previous 2020 budget, which um, in several different areas that didn't really seem to me. I mean, uh, that we should be making any increases at this point in time. There was increases to Grand Central by six, I think, uh, sixteen million. There was increases for salaries, and quite frankly. If we have to go forward, I'd rather just see us go forward with the status quo at this point in time until we really get a a feel or recognition on of what this COVID virus is is doing to Transnet and to to uh, income and things like that. So, as written, I can't, I can't support it, but um, I think maybe we just go with the previous 2020 budget and recirculate what we had originally without any increases to it. Um, Mike, if we have to do that, that would be prudent. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Vivian Moreno. I just want to see if you guys can hear me. Yes. OK, good. I, I have no comments. OK, is there anyone else that uh, has a comment regarding the possibility of uh, delaying this item or continuing this item uh, until we have more uh, input uh, on the impacts? Uh, Vice Chair Blake Spear. Catherine Blakespear. Stand by Catherine. Go ahead. Thank you. I would agree with the comments that we should not be increasing and um, we should consider a different action today that would still be in line with what the attorney has said. Thank you. Uh, 
Council Member Schumacher. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the previous comments um, regarding needing more information and wanted to ask uh, how, how quickly staff um, could get an assessment back to the board. Thank you, Corey. Uh, let's continue with these comments and then we can have uh, staff respond uh, to the questions that are raised. Uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Alejandra. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm here. I just got unmuted. I just wanted to, to share again, echo the sentiments uh, with the previous, as uh, uh, Corey mentioned. Um, but as long as we move forward with um, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, the new draft budget or going with uh, Supervisor Desmond's um, point of the 2020, as long as we're not violating, and again, to uh, Council President's uh, point earlier, will there be any fines or any anything that we will be, um, you know, punitive or any punitive um, measures that will be taken upon us if we were to delay it, you know, to the April 7th or whatever the next board meeting is, um, if you could have the city, uh, the attorney, uh, Leo Council just address that part. If it's two weeks, you know, because we need a little bit more, we go with the status quo. Um, I think it'd be good to to know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jones. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring up, um, you know, I and I agree with uh, Supervisor Desmond. Um, so. The the uh, benefits and the salaries have increased about 35% in this uh, budget. And so if we are going to um, have it come back to us, um, because some of those are um, for current employees by about $30,000 per employee, um, I would like to have our auditor look at this. I think it would be prudent for us to, you know, especially what's going on financially. Um, there's so much uncertainty. I think it would be very important for us to have her take a look at this and when it comes back to us that she's actually audited um, what is happening right now today um, and I, I think this would be a, an excellent point for her to uh, look at because we do need to make sure that we are being prudent with our taxpayer dollars so um, that would be um, I guess that would be a motion to include that our auditor would have um, uh, authority over this and take a look at this and give us a full report and for us to be able to vote on her actual action of what she believes that we should do. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a, a question of our council. So we have a board policy that says we have to have a draft budget by April 1st. What would it take uh, to create a board policy that gives us leeway in light of an emergency such as we have uh, to change that board policy to give us a little more uh, breathing room? Well, it's it's actually the bylaws. It's not board policy, and your bylaws are a little bit more stringent in both waiver and amendment. Uh, the bylaws require notification to all jurisdictions in advance of amending the bylaws, and that would have to be certainly noticed per the Brown Act additionally. Um, Taking a look quickly at a, at the amendment section here, so we could we could uh, agendize a an item as early as April 10th to look at modifying your bylaws, uh, and I think we can give notice to jurisdictions to do that. Normally, modifications to your bylaws come through the executive committee to comment on, but I believe they could also the board still retains that authority and they could come directly to the board as well. Okay. Uh, any other comment or question not uh, um, not on the uh, the text of the draft budget, but uh, whether or not we should uh, uh, delay this discussion? Uh, Georgette, uh, you started this. Georgette Gomez, please. Please unmute Georgette Gomez. 
There you go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Voss. Um, so um, in, in lieu of everybody's comments, um, I, I actually want to make a motion to uh, direct staff to create a budget that is reflective of uh, the impacts that are related to COVID-19 um, and bring that back. And if we even need to bring back a emergency bylaw amendments just relating to the budget, I would also direct staff to do that. Um, I do believe that right now and probably in a couple of years, it's going to take us a little bit of time to come back to normality, but I, I, I just don't see how we can ignore the significant impacts economically that we're hitting. And I think we need to look at the budget differently from here till I don't know exactly when. I, I do have to say that as we're crafting perhaps a bylaw amendment, we should also, because right now I can, I can tell you that the city of San Diego is exploring the possibility of at least for this fiscal year doing a quarterly budget uh, process with, with council. That's an idea that we're exploring right now, just because we don't foresee bringing forward a full year uh, budget that it's really going to be a roller coaster related to the fiscal impacts that we're going to be dealing with. So um, we're going to need to be a little bit nimble and more creative for this particular budget just because we're getting impacted. So I would love to direct, uh, my motion is to direct staff to draft a, a draft budget that is including the uh, impacts related to COVID-19 and also draft a bylaw amendments that will allow us to be a bit more flexible for this coming year. Okay. Uh, and I see a number of hands going up and I, I'm going to work through them. So be patient with me, please. Uh, Mr. Kirk, just a question about uh, uh, if we were to undertake a uh, bylaw change, uh, could that not be done uh, in a more timely manner with a special meeting? Uh, taking, having looked through the amendment section, I believe that could be done as soon as the really the only noticing that you need is regular 72 hour Brown Act noticing. So we could do it as, as under a special meeting, we could do it at the April 10th meeting, which would be a regular meeting. Either one of those would be a possibility. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna start to work through these and uh, I know Hassan's gonna wanna speak too, but let me get through some more board member comment. Uh, Vice Chair Blakespear. Catherine Blakespear, please, there. Yes, I second the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Baber. Um, I, um, I concur in, in, um, on Georgette's motion, but I wanted to respond to Mayor Jones who asked for a report on the salaries. I checked with our, our auditor and it'd take us uh, two months perhaps, so factor that in to get you that report back. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Uh, I just uh, rose my hand to second the motion and uh, um, yeah, uh, Mayor Blakespear beat me to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Zito. Yeah, I think um, I'm supportive of the motion. I was just curious from a process perspective if you know, well, one clarity on the motion makers, I assume the, the amendment would be generally focused for this year and not in general. But two, if from a process perspective, if there's any reason why we couldn't uh, <clears throat> adopt a draft budget today, so we don't have to do that and just say, part of the motion is to come back with an updated draft budget that we then continue to review as per what the motion makers guidelines are just from the perspective of, is it easier to go and do a bylaw adjustment or can we just, you know, you know, kind of swallow a bitter pill and saying, hey, we can adopt this draft budget, make a motion to go ahead and create an updated draft budget subject to the constraints that Council President Gomez just said, because I am supportive of that, but just from a procedural perspective, what what is likely easier to do? Thanks. Uh, Mr. Feller. Good morning. Um, there isn't one, <clears throat> pardon me, one city that thinks they're going to have a, a budget that uh, 
probably supersedes what their existing budget is uh, in in employees as well as salaries. Nobody is uh, expecting more money, so I I I agree with this uh, motion, but I also think that we we really need to as a cities county uh, just to step back and uh, the federal government by the time they are finished giving us everything in the world uh, there's not going to be much money coming out of them either so or the state so um, I, I think we've got serious uh, repercussions as we go forward so that's it thank you mr. Minto Um, thank you. Um, I actually uh, was thinking the same thing that uh, uh, David was thinking about. Um, comply with the bylaws. Uh, just because you um, would approve this draft budget now doesn't mean it has to come back the same way it is. Uh, that way you get around the bylaws problem uh, because I do with agree with uh, what Georgette's saying about, you know, hey, let's uh, redo this. And I wanted to point out that in the... Um, in the uh, staff report, there was a line that said, the economy is healthy. Well, I think that has to be reevaluated this time. So it would actually almost make the, um, the report uh, kind of uh, outdated. I hate to say that about the staff's work because I know they did a great job, but um, I agree with David. We need to probably just uh, approve this now and have everything come back and approve it later on as a uh, adjusted draft budget. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate all the comments. Um, you know, I, I kind of like, I, I like the motion that's in place. Um, however, you know, if we go with the, uh, which, what's being suggested, uh, just go ahead and accept it and know we're gonna change it later, um, I couldn't support that with the increases that are in there now. So if we wanted to go ahead and accept the proposed budget today, so we don't have the bylaw issue or the draft, um, I could only support that if it did not have the $55 million in increases uh, and uh, it went forward without that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let me call on uh, Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and great comments uh, on the budget and uh, will take in. But I, I just want to, two things. One is, as, as our chief counsel mentioned, there is a risk of missing the April 1st deadline, but that risk probably is worth taking, given the, the points you raised. Uh, I would like to point out that Ray Major today is going to talk to you about some potential impacts, but I also want you to know that we wouldn't know the full impact uh, of the corona uh, virus on this for, for probably a few months. And uh, the intention was to move this draft budget and come back to you next month and the month after before June 30th with updates as we know information coming in. Right now, I think if say if you want to measure it in weeks, it would be very hard to know exactly. But I'd like you to hear from both Andre and Andre Major, uh, and maybe uh, maybe decide then whether you just wanna uh, you wanna move it forward as a draft, or you want us to come back and uh, you wanna take the risk of missing the April Ferris bylaw deadline. We're open to all of this, but I think you will you will benefit from hearing from Andre Major and Andre about the initial thinking of what this impact could be. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, Chair Benelli. Gary Benelli. Stand by, Gary. Can we get Gary Benelli unmuted, please? Thank you. Well. There you go, Gary. What, Gary Benelli, Port of San Diego. One of the areas you should look at in your budget is 
uh, the member agency assessments, being all the agencies are being impacted by the pandemic. One of the things that staff can easily do, uh, a good evaluation of where the member agency assessment should stand going into the new budget year. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go back to Georgette. Uh, Georgette, any further comments or otherwise I'd like you to restate your motion. Yeah, no, thank you, Mayor. And uh, my motion still stands. I hear everybody, but I just feel that it is irresponsible for us to, uh, even if we were to move forward this current budget as a draft, I, it's not reflective of today's economy, even just right now as we speak. So if that were to be true, then I would want us to be reviewing a draft budget that is based on right now, not even knowing what the impacts will be. I know Hassan made a reference that it's gonna take us a while and I get that it will take us a while to get a better understanding for all agencies of what the impacts are economically and we're gonna to need to readjust. But even the one right now in front of us, is not reflective, it, it just ignores the reality and i just feel that it's really irresponsible for us to ignore that and pass a draft budget and and i i wouldn't even be able to support that so my motion still stands as is i think it's the responsible thing to do and uh and and so yes thank you so i just want to be clear your motion is to uh, continue this item uh, pending more input and also undertake the steps that would be required uh, through a special meeting uh, or uh, whatever is the most uh, direct route to uh, change our bylaws to allow uh, more time with this. Am, am I restating yes, that, that is, correctly? That is correct. In addition to that, aside from uh, uh, amending the bylaws to allow us to have a different budget schedule, create a draft a budget that is really that is reflective as reflective as it can be to the impacts to the COVID nineteen. Okay, uh, I, I will just say for the record, I, I'm supportive of that. Uh, we're in uncharted territory and uh, this draft budget uh, in essence is a roadmap, but you can't have a roadmap when it's uncharted territory. So I, I'm gonna be supportive uh, of this. Uh, we have a motion and a second. I don't see any further hands up uh, for comment. Uh, uh, Mr. Kirk, do we need to take, oh, yes. I have public Cousin. comment on this item. Okay, go with it. I will read the public comment into the record. Oscar Medina with Environmental Health Coalition, Dendag board members. I ask that as you develop the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans for the Blue Line I-5 and Purple Line 805 corridors, that you study the Blue Line Express and Purple Line projects respectively, the remaining 2.4 million in planning money for each of these CMCPs should take a serious look at how we make a transit leap at these key quarters so that transit can become a competitive alternative to driving. It's also critical that Sandag preserve the viability of the Blue Line Express project. In other words, please make sure that any money that Sandag spends in the program budget does not create an engineering or operational conflict that would preclude the Blue Line Express from being built. The blue line is set to receive several improvements soon, such as rail grade separations and significant track enhancement. That is not appropriate. If that, if not appropriately designed, can make Blue Line Express not viable. Please study the Blue Line Express and Purple Line projects in their respective CMCPs and keep the Blue Line Express a viable option. Thank you. That is all the public comment I have. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, now, Tessa, we will need you to uh, undertake the roll call vote. Thank you, Chair. We're pulling up the voting slide now. Council Member Schumacher, City of Carlsbad. Schumacher, aye. Mayor Salas, City of Chula Vista. Mayor Salas, you are self-muted. Salas, aye. aye. 
Mayor Bailey, City of Coronado. Bailey, <clears throat> Bailey, yes. Supervisor Desmond, County of San Diego. Supervisor Desmond, yes. Mayor Haviland, City of Del Mar. Haviland is a yes. Mayor Wells, City of El Cajon. Mayor Wells, you are self-muted. Mayor Wells, yes. Vice Chair Blake Spear, City of Encinitas. Blake Spear, yes. Mayor McNamara, City of Escondido. Yes. Mayor Dedina, City of Imperial Beach. Dedina, yes. Councilmember Baber, City of La Mesa. Yes. Mayor Vasquez, City of Lemon Grove. Mayor, you are, oh, there you go. Yes. Mayor Sotelo Solis, City of National City. Sotelo Solis, yes. Deputy Mayor Fuller, City of Oceanside. Yes. Chair Voss, City of Poway. Yes. Mayor, I'm sorry, Council Member Moreno, City of San Diego. Yes. Mayor Jones, City of San Marcos. Rebecca, I have I have been trying to tell you that I've been trying. I I had comments, but I was not. Um, I was ignored. So I'm just letting you know um, there was an issue. I don't I don't know what to say about it, but my vote is yes. Mayor Minto, City of Santee. Minto, yes. Councilmember Zito, City of Solana Beach. Zito, yes. Mayor Ritter, City of Vista. Mayor Ritter, you are self mute. There you go. Ritter, yes. That concludes the roll call vote. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, move Chair on Boss. to, uh, yes. Chair Boss, excuse me, I'm sorry. I need to state for the record that item nine vote passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, item 10, uh, Office of the Independent Performance Auditor to request for additional audit resources. Uh, Mr. Baber, would you please uh, introduce this item? Yes, our independent performance auditor, Mary, who we just call Mary Kay, did a deep dive analysis to determine the resources she needs to do her job. And the full analysis is, and supporting documents are in your agenda package. Let me obviate the uh, uh, obvious problem, which is about uh, how do you do a budget in this COVID-19 crisis? The independent um, auditor's office is a separate budget line item from the full sandbag budget. That's why we're number 10 and not number nine. And as we go through this, Mary's going to explain what she thinks uh, she needs and what the audit committee agreed to it. But as a funding, 
we are ask, going to ask for a funding source independent of uh, what you just talked about. We believe we have a valid claim to have the state reimburse us because we believe AB 805 was a state mandate. So we'll get to that later. We have filed the test claim uh, to the state and depending on how the state responds to that test claim, we'll know our status and we'll come back to you and let you know that. And if the state completely rejects our test claim, Hassan and I and Mary have, have been talking about uh, finding other ways to fund what Mary needs um, and we'll have to bring that back to you. So uh, let me um, let Mary go on from here and give you her full report. It's in the backup so you, you could go back and look later. Mary? Thank you, Council Member Baber. Good morning, Chair Voss, Vice Chair Blake Spear, and members of the board. I would like to first apologize, apologize in advance for a somewhat lengthy presentation. I ask that you be uh, patient and understanding and also active in your listening as I am presenting not only the fiscal year 21 budget, but also addressing additional staffing needs and support and reasoning for those needs and why I'm asking for additional resources when SANDAG is in the process of reducing workforce and to top it all off, now what we are all facing with this unknown factor around the coronavirus. Um, this could also lead to, as you all have been discussing today, the unknown factors around lost revenue and other, other funding sources. I hope after I uh, present this that I've been able to answer a lot of your questions, um, and we will also have time for questions uh, after the presentation. Additionally, the board has been provided a full detail of my analysis and a revised audit plan that supports the need for additional staffing starting on page 638 of your agenda package. If the board would like to follow along with this presentation and or take notes of the presentation, this can be found starting on page 685 of your agenda package. I know that President uh, Gomez had a question regarding the um, audit plan and the approval of the audit plan. The revised uh, audit plan is also included in this agenda package, starting on page 669 that you can refer to. Uh, there was an uh, original uh, audit plan that was approved through the audit committee back in last May, I wanna say, and then brought to the board, I believe around September for approval that went along with last year's budget. So that has been done, and, and again, today, it is in your packages starting on page 669. Moving forward, I would like to use um, acronyms of IPA, and I just wanna let everyone know, IPA means Independent Performance Auditor, and OIPA, which is the Office of Independent Performance Auditor. For the purpose of this presentation, I would like to cover the following areas. A few references from AB 805 as it relates to the IPA, as well as the state mandate, responsibilities of the IPA in accordance with AB 805, a little history about the previous audit resources prior to AB 805, identified risks thus far, and then results of the audit resource analysis that was performed by my office to support additional needs and discuss potential funding. Next slide, please. Further, in regard to AB 805, I wanted to provide you with some specific language relating to, apologize, I skipped ahead. Uh, AB 805 section 15 provides the IPA to appoint staff deemed necessary to perform the duties and responsibilities required by the IPA. It further defines those responsibility and provides additional requirements around internal auditing control guidelines. Next slide, please. Further in regard to AB 805, I wanted to provide you with specific language regarding the state mandate. Section 19 provides information that recognizes that the requirements that resulted, as a res that resulted from AB 805 and related increased costs that were not required prior to AB 805 
did in fact create an additional cost burden on SANDAG, which allows for SANDAG to then file a test claim to determine if a state mandate cost reimbursement can be filed. The test claim process will be explained to you later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. To provide background of responsibilities of the IPA in a generalized manner, the IPA is the official body to investigate potential fraud, waste, and abuse identified by staff, the public, and other stakeholders. Our responsibilities include facilitation of risk, reviews of all things SANDAG, which include consultants, contractors, operational and system controls, and reviews around areas to ensure operational efficiencies and effectiveness. Lastly, as a reminder, the IPA also, provide, also reports directly to the board, providing more independence both in fact and appearance at all levels of review over SANDAG. Next slide, please. Prior to AB 805, since the 1980s, SANDAG had only 1.5 internal audit positions. Needless to say, this was insufficient audit resources, resources for an organization this size, both in budgeted amounts and number of staff, to ensure that system controls were appropriate, adequate, and working as designed. Additionally, the internal audit report reported directly to management. The plan was approved by management. The management that provided the auditor's performance evaluation gave the auditor raises and bonuses. Additionally, there were no audit committee and the plan did not go to the board for approval. In reviewing the last peer review, which is required by professional auditing standards, over the three-year period, 24 engagements were performed by the internal auditor. Of the 24, only seven were audit reviews, while 17 were non-audit reviews. For an agency this size with this level of inherent risk, the numbers at best should have been switched. Next slide, please. With the onboarding of the IPA coming up on one year since my April 2nd, 2019 hire, I wanted to provide the board a quick overview of the successes and accomplishments that have been able to move, we've been able to move forward. When I say we, this includes Chair Baber, Vice Chair Wells, and the members of the audit committee. With that, there have been two main areas of focus over this past year. The first area was really to set up the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor. And like management, an auditor is required to follow policies and procedures. So those were developed. An audit manual was developed um, as in accordance with GAGAS, which is also required by AB 805. We revised Board Policy 39 to incorporate professional auditing standards and best practices. We planned and developed OPA's two-year business and audit plan that went to the audit committee as well as the board. We managed the audit committee agenda. We prepared last year's budget and proposed this year's budget. We relocated SANDAG's one internal audit position, which we will be hiring in April. And we hired our first audit auditor that was approved by the board last fiscal year and prepared this analysis of audit resource needs. Next slide, please. The second area of focus was to perform an agency risk assessment. As part of our organizational wide risk assessment, it was not only necessary because SANDAG had never had an in-depth organizational wide risk assessment prior to my onboarding, but it was also a requirement both by the state controller's office and the Office of Budget, Budget and Management that manages govern, government grants. Further, prior to 2018, SANDAG had never had a risk manager officer. This position is still being developed and the plan is to work closely together to ensure the success and help mitigate SANDAG risk. The risk assessment process involved a holistic approach Typically at the start of each year, prior to the development of an audit plan, the auditor will perform a risk assessment. 
this risk assessment is usually talking to management and sometimes the board. This type of assessment is typically a reactive versus a proactive approach. This holistic approach is very much a proactive approach where employees from all levels and areas within the organization have been selected to participate. The process included providing training on a risk understanding to help those selected employees understand from their perspective and through their eyes what it is we mean by risk. In, ad in addition to the agency-wide risk assessment, the office developed and the board passed Board Policy 41, Internal Control Standards, that was required by AB 805 and State Controller's Office. Board Policy 42, Reporting of Fraud, Waste, and Abuse, also required by AB 805. And we went live with both OPA's webpage and the Fraud, Waste, and Abuse hotline. I should mention that since we went live with those a few months ago, I've already performed two investigations and closed them both. The risk assessment is still ongoing and the report will be ready for issuance in May or early June. Next slide, please. Though the final risk report has not yet been released, the process around identifying inherent risk and initial risk assessment, including a review of the organizational right, organization risk discussion with the board members and audit committee members, and the analysis of risk survey responses, risk around the following areas have been factored in to date and develop, factored in to date and developed the revised audit plan that supports the need for additional resources that was approved by the audit committee in February. As I've st stated in prior meetings with the audit committee, SANDEC is an inherently risky agency as are most governments dealing with public money that have no bottom line or profit line to fall back on. These risks include areas around capital projects, construction, around bidding process, adherence to contracts, invoices, and tracking, consultants, operational around use of uh, credit cards, travel, and other resources, forecasted revenues and projected costs, taxpayer dollars to assure both in fact and appearance, accountability and transparency, federal and state funds, assuring that we are adhering to OMB and state regulations around continuous monitoring and system controls, state and federal oversight requirements, operational efficiencies, waste, abuse and resources, and inadequate system controls around safeguarding of assets, separation of duties, updated policies and procedures, and management override. Next slide, please. In January, when hiring our first auditor, my office was able to perform a risk analysis for resources. This is typically done when an audit function in an organization is being developed. We used our local government in the San Diego area, as well as other special districts, including SCAG and the Port of San Diego. We also used other governments that had similar budget dollar sizes that would ensure that when we chose, when we used to compare, we were using similar dollar and number of CIP projects for our comparisons. The results show that OPA had a considerable larger dollar oversight responsibility per auditor than those compared. This was the case both in total budget and by CIP budget. When looking at San Diego agency, the total dollar budget, staff found that, San, that Sandag auditors had more than 109 million more dollar per oversight than that of County of San Diego, nearly four times more than that of the city of San Diego and nearly 19 times more than that of the Port of San Diego. When we were looking at San Diego agencies and only using the capital improvement project budget, staff found that SANDAG auditors had more than 91 times the dollar oversight per auditor than the Port of San Diego, nearly 42 times more than the County of San Diego, and more than 13 times more than the City of San Diego. We also looked at CIP using the number of projects. 
SANDAG's average number of project oversight responsibility is significantly higher than those compared, leaving SANDAG open to un many unaudited projects and potential fraud, waste, and abuse laws. Next slide, please. For those that relate better to graphs than narrative, this graph shows using bars the dollar oversight per auditor responsibility, both for the total budget and for capital improvement projects. Here you can see with the green bar that SANDAG's dollar oversight per auditor responsibility for the total budget is approximately 678 million per auditor. And for the CIP in gold, the dollar oversight responsibility per auditor is approximately 463 million per auditor. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this graph shows that SANDAG CIP by project rather than by dollar. It's important to point out that we compared staff resource needs both in terms of CIP dollars and by project. This is because each CIP project, regardless if the dollar amount is 20 million or 2 million for each project, it takes the same amount of audit resources due to the fact that the audit processes and procedures that are required by professional auditing standards do not change because of the dollar amount. The graph shows that SANDAG's project per auditor oversight is much higher, 61 projects per auditor, than those compared with the exception of the city of San Jose, who has 78 projects per auditor. However, if you look back on the previous graph, you will see that each project is considerably lower for the city of San, Diego, San Jose's per dollar per project than SANDAG. It should be noted that other factors were considered, such as SANDAG's increases and decreases of the number of CIP projects from year to year as well as the dollar amount of each of those projects. Given the nature of SANDAG and the lower number, the low number of additional audit resources being questioned, the concern that OPA be overstaffed would never be an issue. As we are asking for much less than what the analysis supports for the audit resources necessary to adequately oversight, provide oversight for SANDAG as an organization. Also, we identified and considered the following ongoing risk factors. For SANDAG, there are many unknown factors for the five big news. The agency has not been sufficiently audited since the start from an internal audit perspective. Federal and state grant requirements do not stop when a project is finished or funds are expended. Audits continue up to three years or more from the last year of appropriation. Ongoing monitoring is required for both federal and state grants. SANDAG is and will continue to be inher inherently risky by the nature of its existence. Contracts and contractors and construction grants use public dollars. When the current intent to reduce SANDAG's, with the current intent to reduce SANDAG's work workforce, the increased use of contractors or consultants bring an increased risk to government organizations as a whole. As we give up control and send something outside, increased risk will occur. Next slide, please. This next slide is provided as an example using the city of San Diego. As stated, it would take an additional 24 auditors to be equal or on par with the city. I can also share that if you spoke with the city or county auditors, both would express the need for additional auditing staff. This is where looking at risk from a holistic perspective is necessary. The additional posi positions requested to cover the risk identified takes into account the assessment of risk, inherent risk, planning and taking proactive approaches with management, consideration of unknown risk potentials and threats, and the fact that funding sources are limited. An unknown risk is a perfect example, unfortunately, that I can provide to you as, as, as live as we are in it is right now, an unknown risk of this crisis. This type of crisis increased audit risk and risk to a government entity 
uh, by by tenfold. It's a very it, it gets into a, a situation of a lot of unknown factors and a lot of decision making is is made quickly and so therefore audit risk increases uh, a great deal. Sorry, moving on. Running um, an accounting office cannot be done with only two people. Not one, not to mention uh, running an not to mention running checks, cutting checks, approving invoices. This isn't possible with just two people. Why would anyone think that two auditors is sufficient to ensure oversight for over 1.8 billion of operational and capital improvement project dollars sent around, centered around public funds? Given the detailed analysis provided in your packages, OPA is seeking only four additional audit with one support staff rather than the 24 that would be on par with even the city of San Diego. Next slide, please. Uh, one more slide, please. Thank you. This graph brings matters even more into perspective. Currently, total, total OPA budget only equates to 1.36% of the total salary and benefits of SANDAG. That's 708,427 of the 52.5 million. The proposed uh, OPA budget, if granted all positions being requested, would only move that up to 2.7% of the total SANDAG salary and benefits making it 1.38 million of the 52.5 million. This is a very small percentage to bring sufficient oversight to an agency that has been and continues to be at risk for overspending both in dollars on their budgets and time. It should also be noted that external auditor scopes are very narrow and are specific to one or two criteria that they are asked to audit. It is usually the assumption of an external auditor that internal auditors are performing detailed operational and system control reviews, and they are relying on that. You will also note that when you have an external auditor join SANDAG to perform a specific task around a, a, a required criteria, they have at least five or six auditors on their team. And this is much narrower, narrower in scope and time than what internal auditors should be looking at on a continuous operational basis. Next slide, please. This slide provides OPA's current budget for fiscal year 1920 and what our current staff looks like. It's important to note that the interns, though they are an amazing part of OPA's team, I might add, they are not auditors and they cannot audit. Next slide, please. This slide provides what OPA's proposed additional staffing would look like. Given the additional staff requested, OPA would be able to provide sufficient audit oversight to this agency that has lacked this oversight for 40 years. It should be noted that for fiscal year 2021, only I seek 100,000 of that additional request that I'm making for a one time one year contract for a data penetration team, as this is one of the areas that have been identified um, as high risk. That data penetration team would not only come in and pe penetrate uh, Sandag's banks and um, around data, uh, but they would also have ongoing training that would provide to the auditors so then we can take that and instill that skill set in one of our auditors and those auditors can on a continuous basis test around data security and assure that, that we have good controls in place for it when it comes to our data. Next slide, please. So this is really the big picture and what I'm asking for if I was to get fully staffed and my request were be, to be granted and we were to find this unknown funding. <laughs> Um, would be one independent performance auditor, which is myself, two principal management internal auditors, which is typically a lead auditor, two associates, and they are typically mid-level auditors, 
two management internal auditors, which are entry level auditors, one administrative support, which currently we do not have, and two interns, as well as other costs associated with training and development. So for the total OPA audit plan for fiscal year 21, if I were granted everything, would be one point, almost 1.4 million, but thereafter fiscal year 21 would be about 1.3 million per year. Next slide, please. Currently, this is what the organizational chart looks like for OPA. Next slide, please. And this is what my proposed OPA organizational chart would look at. And as you can see, I've really taken and divided the uh, office into two categories so we can have really full coverage and, and really ensure that we are identifying and hitting on the risk areas to minimize those risks and to bring more efficiencies and effectiveness to the organization. One side of the house would really be handling the higher uh, risk um, issues that the board's concerned with, that Hassan is concerned with, areas that we see could be risky just over one project per se. The other side of the house will be the continuous monitoring side of the house where they are continuously monitoring grants, um, oversight, management override, operational efficiencies. It's really what is needed from, a, again, a holistic approach um, to this, this uh, proposed organizational chart. Next, next page, please. Now, as an auditor, I've learned in many of my positions, and, and I've done this a few times over the years, you can't come to the table and bring a problem without a solution. So with that, the next phase of this presentation, I will go over quickly with you, and I've got two, um, two options that I'm proposing today. It should be noted that during the audit committee, there was a three to one vote at the audit committee, and it was not over the fact that resources were needed. That was sufficiently supported and has been supplied to you in your agenda packages. Rather, it was over the mention of increasing membership fees. Some audit committee members believed it was not within their authority to say how it would get funded rather than it was just needed. As an auditor, it's always been my responsibility to come prepared with a budget of both sides, expense and funding. With that, one of the options at that time was to increase membership fees. There was an, uh, uh, Chair Baber, the audit committee Chair Baber, was not in agreement with this as he felt that they had already been increased sufficiently the year before. It has become clear to me that membership fees has been doubled and therefore this was not an option. So this option has been off the table and removed and um, I don't disagree with that. So the two options we are left with um, are the state mandated claim, which is a potential for us in accordance with AB 805 section 19, or to redirect staff funding typically as part of overhead and is allowed in the ICRP federal overhead rate calculation. Next slide, please. So the two options that I bring to you today are really the state mandated claim potential in accordance with AB 805, in order to open this door, a test claim was submitted. I worked with Chair Baber on this, who permitted me to develop this 34-page test claim and narrative, which was signed by the CFO, who was authorized to sign and submitted to the Commission on State Mandates on March 19th. I can go through this process quick, quickly with you to provide a flow chart, but I have provided a flow chart of the process. The test claim, was also reviewed by John Kurt Sandegg's general counsel. It should be really clear that this test claim is really just to leave the door open. It is not filing for mandate reimbursement. Uh, I audited um, mandated costs and test claims and, and the whole uh, mandate process for about nine years while I was at state controller's office. So filing a test claim is really just really the, the, the very beginning and it allows you to have a door open should you want to file um, a mandated claim for increased cost in the future. 
Um, the process is typically you file a test claim, they accept it or reject it, and really it's to determine do you have increased costs that are been incurred that did not occur prior to AB 805, and in, in fact, we, we do. And I think I supported that sufficiently and pulled in laws and regulations that also supported it. We will get the response back, and the response could go either way at this point. But if it does go forward, and I have proven our case sufficiently, the next phase would be to provide parameters and guidelines, which then goes to the state controller's office for approval, and then opens that door for discussion about how much, along with all the other mandates out there, they are going to appropriate for us. And then we would file a mandated claim and support that with sufficient cost invoices, actual salaries and benefits, which we can do in, with no problem. I was very conservative in my test uh, claim. I, I offset the membership fees that paid for my, my position already, because there is a category in there where you do have to offset any membership fees. That's been done. I've addressed additional funding possibilities. So I really believe um, in my conservative review of what I provided them and I'm asking for is really just to cover um, one of OPA's um, current positions and then the four auditing positions. The other option is, like I said, we work with Hassan and look for, for other potential fundings. Next slide, please. This slide is really a, a simple, it's, it's on uh, Commission on State Mandates website, and it really explains each step that you have to go through. And you can see that on this slide, it shares the test claim and what that really means, and then moves you through the entire process. Next, please. This concludes my presentation to the board. As we move to the action items, the IPA would like to request a change in the action items that were initially there and, and the recommendation for action. We not only, uh, we have not, we were not able to really iron out this, the next steps, but in speaking with Chair, Audit Committee Chair Baber, we would like to propose the following actions. One, accept the audit committee's recommendation for the additional staffing resources needed and provide sufficient that would provide sufficient oversight and two direct sandex executive director to work together with the audit committee and the ipa on funding options to bring back to the board for consideration so really what i'm asking is that you agree with the audit committee and my very detailed analysis on audit resources that yes, the positions are necessary to be able to accommodate and carry out the responsibilities in AB 805, and to just have the director work with me and the audit committee to figure out how this might get funded. That concludes my presentation, and I welcome any questions from the board members. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is, if there are technical questions uh, for Mary, uh, I, I'd like to start with those, then we will uh, go to public comment and then comment on this. So first, technical questions only, and I'm first going to go to uh, Audit Committee Chair Baber. Um, there you go. Th thank you, Chairman Boss. I, I can listen to the rest of the comments, but I was going to make the motion. And to bottom line it for you, which Mary did a great job, it's number one, accept the idea that we need these extra staff to do the job. Two, um, give direct our SANDAG staff to work with Mary and the Audit Committee to fully process the claim. And three, if the state rejects it or accepts it but refuses to fully fund it, to direct Hassan to work with us to a backup financing plan. Okay, thanks. Uh, we will come back to motions and uh, at the appropriate time. Again, I want to limit this to technical questions. Uh, uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. 
Hi there, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, for the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one question I have is how many staff uh, does the audit uh, group, uh, Mary's team, currently consist of? Uh, so we have um, true reference as to what, what it looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mary or Bill? Yeah. I can respond to that. Um, that's been provided um, both in the presentation I just gave you and in the detail. Currently, um, there's myself, two interns, one uh, auditor that I just hired effective this January, and then we've taken the internal auditor um, position that was just vacant and moved it up to OPA to give it more independence, of course. So currently, we, are, we have two auditors, two interns, and myself. Thank you, Mayor Minto. Mayor John Minto, there you go, John. Yeah, you know what? I tried to put my hand down because I it wasn't a technical question. So I'll come okay, back to thanks. me. Okay, thanks. Uh, Georgette, your hand is up, but I don't know if it's really up. No, I didn't. I didn't have a question. Okay, thank you, uh, Tessa. Let's go to uh, public comment, please. Thank you, Chair. I do not have public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. All right, now for, uh, we'll go to uh, comments and uh, anything you want to say. Supervisor Desmond. Let's get supervisor. There you go. No? There. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, and Mary, if anything, uh, you have proven you are very thorough. Uh, in your presentation, and uh, I'd, I'd like to second the motion uh, that you need more help, and uh, we need to find the funds to uh, to get you there. So I'll second the motion. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mayor Jones. Thank you very much. Um, I, I I agree with the uh, motion. I was wondering if the maker of the motion would um, uh, consider one thing. So to meet the goals of transparency, we really need the proper funding, obviously, um, to allow us. And I would like to have monthly reports and then always an actionable, not always an actionable, actionable item every single month, but when uh, we are taking action on things, we, I, I, when we get uh, a report that is information only, I don't think that's really meeting the spirit of what um, our, our goals are and what our oversight should be. And, you know, for us as the um, oversight committee, which is the board of directors uh, of the, I'm sorry, the committee oversight of the OIPA, I think it's important that we do have actionable items. So if, if, uh, the, if the uh, maker of the motion would consider that we would have an actionable item, uh, that it would be actionable items uh, brought forward to the board, but also um, in between monthly reports, um, I would like to um, see if the maker of the motion would consider that thank you okay, let's let's first go to uh, mayor minto then we'll go back to the maker of the motion okay thank you very much um i i have to tell you i've been sitting at this board of directors for quite a while and this is probably one of the most detailed reports that i've heard so i want to thank mary Kay very much for that and uh thanks bill for um leading this effort um I think that uh, this is a an extremely worthwhile um, expenditure. Don't know where we're going to get it. Maybe we can take it from something else that's not being done right now. But um, to hear some of the information this report points out, some of the reasons why we have some people that challenge what we do from time to time as being either oh, I guess uh, prudent or something that's uh, well within our budget and should be done even at all. And I think they have reports like this that demonstrate the direction that we are going in or maybe we should go in um, are absolutely necessary. So I'm going to speak in favor of the motion and say that we should fund this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Baber. Um, to uh, Mayor Jones, um, item seven should have been brought to you as a um, action item. It slipped through, and I'm taking responsibility for that. 
Number two is after we saw that, uh, Mary and I are, are um, reorganizing how we docket things at the audit committee. So don't worry, the actionable items will come back as actionable to you. And the, you know, the, the stuff that's truly information will be information. I've done a lot of docketing in my career. We'll make it right for you. This was just a mistake. And then the um, second thing about a monthly report, Mary does keep reports. I'm not sure if monthly is the appropriate time. I'd have to ask her, but um, in terms of giving you regular reports, yes, Mary, do you want to respond to what would be an appropriate time to give a regular report? I don't know if monthly's within your scope and, or, you, do, you know, what do you think, Mayor? Uh, uh, thank you. I think that um, sometimes monthly reports, and I don't mind giving a monthly report. We do it at the audit committee meeting where we say, hey, this is what's going on. This is where we're at in a process of a review. Um, and then we always bring the finalized report uh, to the audit committee on a monthly basis. So, you know, something we have to realize is audits don't take a day or, you know, if you truly want to support an audit, there's a lot that goes into, and I'd be happy to share it with anybody individually, a lot that goes into an audit process to hack, to support a report, um, because we always have to uh, do a report with the understanding that it may end up in court one day. So there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of evidence that needs to be co collected, a lot of interviewing, a lot of testing. And so I'm happy to, to bring to the board every month a quick update of what's going on in my office and where we're at on things. Um, I'm really open to any of that. Uh, and then we'll leave it up to Bill and the board to direct me on that. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Um, how about Mayor Jones? We'll add to the motion that the audit, the auditor and the audit committee will bring uh, regular and frequent reports and not put a time frame on it. And if after a few months, uh, we're not doing that job. You can impose a monthly rule on us. Would that work? Mayor Jones. Can we get Mayor Jones? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. That would be perfect. Thank you. And is that good with uh, Supervisor Desmond, the second? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, going to uh, Georgette, please. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for that really thorough presentation. And also I, I would echo the report was really good. Uh, no question that there is, uh, in terms of the request, I, I think it's the right request. I just, in terms of the timing, I, I am having difficulty justifying um, not this is not speaking against the request and i don't know how to frame it but i just feel that going back to the previous conversation about the budget it it, it just it, we got to think about that this is a significant cost a cost worth eventually having but i just at this moment i'm, I'm having difficulty justifying it not knowing how things are going to look in the near future and while we're approving positions for this very critical function that I'm hoping that it's going to get us to have better system improvements, um, that's ultimately the goal. Is just it's 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 hard to figure out how this is going to be um, embedded into the budget, and maybe this is incorporated into the budget. Um, so not knowing not knowing that connection that makes it hard for me to support the request. Uh, not because I don't. I, I get the critical function that the audit committee does. It will do, but I just at this moment I, I just can't uh, support the, the the request at all. Um, Thank you, uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Sotelo Solis. Hi. Uh, thanks again. Um, I wanted to thank uh, um, uh, Mary Jane for the presentation, and again to echo the sentiments of uh, Council President Georgette. We just had a thorough conversation on our budget concerns given COVID. We did not move forward with that budget because we didn't know the uncertainty and what it was, what our revenue projections were going to do. When I asked about how many team members or staff members the audit group actually had. It has two auditors, two interns, and one OPI staffer. 
So, you know, that as of right now, that's a five person team and I get it. I've been audit committee chair for several nonprofits and it's not easy to do an audit. You have to interview, you have to understand a full process. Um, and when we looked at AB 805 for that transparency purpose, it was, you know, to introduce this position and to really make sure that there was transparency. Um, however, you know, two of the recommendations, uh, what I heard uh, from the uh, auditor was uh, to potentially uh, find an increased fees to the city. Well, that means that as we're talking about our own revenues, if there's going to be any fee assessment, that's going to be across the board. And right now we're talking about tightening our own budgets within our own municipalities. So that's of concern to find money that we uh, we didn't pass as part of the budget. Again, item before, it's uh, extremely challenging. And the numbers are asking us for an additional $673,000 for this next fiscal year. Again, um, I would um, uh, support looking at a state mandated reimbursement claim. It's not too late. We have to April 1st, so that's okay. Uh, that is uh, basically where uh, I'm at with that. Um, and with that, I'd like to make a substitute motion that the um, recommendations that move forward are to one, work within our means, and with regards to the budget, we um, we work with staff or staff works with the auditor um, to identify what a realistic uh, budget number would be and whether or not it can be um, um, added to the budget uh, for the 2021 cycle. Um, so you. that's my substitute yeah. motion. Thank you. Thank you. Let me have Mary Kay respond and then we'll go to other speakers. Yes, thank you. Um, just to, to clarify a few items, um, currently there are not five auditors. There are two auditors and myself, and, and I'm like a director who has many hats. Um, the two auditors that just one was hired in January will be taking on another one um, in April, hopefully. Two, it has to be clarified, two interns are not able to audit they are not auditors and then myself of course i do audits um, at a higher level as well as maintain the office do the budgets do the everything else that any other director does additionally i removed and did not use the the fees as a as a potential in fact i said at the beginning the fees are not an option and i provided only two options which was the mandate and then overhead, which we are typically part of overhead and, and are reimbursed through the federal ICRP and covered that way, which is a, 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 an option that, that most agencies actually use. Um, but just to clarify, there, there are only two auditors and myself. There are not a five audit team. And we did um, do a, a pretty detailed analysis using five agencies in the local area that are similar to us size and dollar wise that showed at, at minimum, we would need 24 more auditors to be on par with one of those agencies. And in some cases, 84 more auditors. So the four auditors that I'm asking for are more than reasonable um, for an organization with the risk inherently and identified risks that SANDAG has and continues to have and for the dollar size of constructions and consultants that SANDAG uh, contracts with. So I can answer more detailed or, or, or further clarify if that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Schumacher. Corey Schumacher. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate all the comments and uh, the detailed report um, by Mary Kay. Um, I will be supporting this, um, the motion, specifically because it's broken down by, um, as, as uh, Mr. Baber mentioned, the accepting of the recommendations for staffing and directing the uh, executive director to work with um, Mary Kay to bring back 
a financial plan that is a backup get if the uh, if the fully processed claim which is also a part of this motion uh, doesn't cover all the costs so with that we'll be receiving the board will be receiving um, a backup financing plan that we will then um, uh, vote to to approve or not approve uh, so with that I would be uh, supporting the motion thank you thank you uh, mayor Mary Salas Thank you so much. And um, listening intently to the conversation, really appreciated the, the report, Mary Kay. And I thought that um, did a great job of, of not only justifying the need for the additional personnel, but really setting a history of what really got us into trouble here um, at, you know, uh, during this, uh, um, during the whole um, discovery that, that we really didn't have the funds that we thought that we had. And um, part of it was the system that we had in place um, for auditing. So I think that AB 805 was correct in uh, calling for an independent auditor and that um, you clearly laid out the case about the openness that we have as an organization to all kinds of um, um, misspending. And I would say that not, not due to irresponsibility, uh, but uh, due to the overwhelming um, responsibility of tracking where all the, the different funds go and all the different projects. So I understand the concerns of some of my colleagues about approving this item during this time, but um, I think that it was clearly stated within the report that we are going to try to go after matching funds that um, this item will come back to us with with the um, an, a financing alternative should we not get those um, gladly support the motion as well thank you uh, mr baber um thank you let me go back and respond to uh, the distinguished mayor of National City and, and Georgette, um, the, uh, my friend and council member. This is technically not in the budget we were discussing in, in item nine. It's a separate budget item. And your concerns about funding at this time, I wholly uh, understand. And that's one of the objections I raised below at the audit committee. But the, the sort of working compromise we came up with was, do we need these positions in, in theory? Yes, we can't really do the job AB 805 asks us to do without it. But can we afford them right now? Practically, probably not. However, we're gonna ask the state for the money because AB 805, we exist and we're authorized to do this under AB 805. If the state comes back and says, we'll fully fund you, we're good. And it's not in Sandag's budget. If the state says, no, we're not, you don't have a right to the claim, or you have a right to the claim, but we're going to give you a dollar, uh, then we have a problem. And then we go back and work with Hassan to come up with an alternate plan. So I, I agree with what um, you two said, but I think this is the best way we can move forward if you will uh, accept that, that we're going to move in good faith to ask the state for the money. And if the state says no, we're going to come back to you with a different plan, and you'll be able to prove it at that time. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Well then, uh, I appreciate that clarification and that makes me feel a whole lot better because then we will still have another crack at uh, really, if we do have to find the money then we can uh, adjust it as part of our budget. Um, so I, uh, I rescind my uh, substitute motion um does the uh audit uh committee or, or uh chair baber do you know when um do you know when the response will be back uh to know from the state of california and whether or not we'll be able to have it before we finalize our budget uh discussions here with uh Sandex? thank you let me um, um see if either mary or mr kirk uh can respond to that because i'm not 100% uh, familiar with the perfect timeline of how the state's going to function. And remember, whatever we say about how the state functions, the COVID-19 
alters it. So Mary or John, what's your opinion yes. on that question? Yes, hi Bill, I can respond to that. Um, typically, if you follow the, the test claim process, they have 10 days to respond. We filed the test claim and they accepted it on March 19th. However, just as Bill said, given the current situation, there may be a delay, but I am hopeful that definitely, if anything, we should hear um, whether they accepted the test claim or not, surely by the end of May. John, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. No, I would defer to your experience on that, Mary. I'm not seeing anything beyond the, the initial 10 days of mandates. Okay, for that uh, motion and a second, uh, I hands raised. I will ask uh, Tessa to please take a roll call vote. Thank you, Chair. As, they, as staff pulls up the slide for voting in the background, Council Member Schumacher, City of Schumacher, aye. Mayor Salas, City of Chula Vista. Mayor, yourself muted. Salas, aye. Mayor Bailey, City of Coronado. Bailey, yes. Supervisor Desmond, County of San Diego. Desmond, yes. Mayor Haviland, City of Del Mar. Haviland, yes. Mayor Wells, City of El Cajon. Tessa, I do not see Bill Wells in the meeting anymore. Thank you. We'll go on to uh, Vice Chair Blake Spear, City of Encinitas. Blake, Blake Spear, yes. Mayor McNamara, City of Escondido. second. Go ahead. McNamara, yes. Mayor Dedina, City of Imperial Beach. Dedina, yes. Councilmember Baber, City of La Mesa. Councilmember, you're self muted. Yes, and thank you all. Mayor Vasquez, City of Lemon Grove. Mayor Vasquez, yes. Mayor Sotelo Solis, City of National City. Mayor Sotelo Solis, yes. Thank you again, Bill, for clarification. Deputy Mayor Feller, City of Oceanside. Feller, yes. Chair Voss, City of Poway. Yes. Councilmember Moreno, City of San Diego. Yes. Mayor Jones, City of San Marcos. Yes. 
Jones, yes. Mayor Minto, City of Santee. Minto, yes. Council Member Zito, City of Solana Beach. Zito, yes. Mayor Ritter, City of Vista. Mayor Ritter, yes. Thank you, Antessa. Thank you. That concludes the roll call vote with 18 of 19 members voting yes. The item passes. It's going to the dogs. That uh, concludes that oh, item. Uh, we come to continued comment. Tessa, do we have any additional non agenda comments that we didn't get to at the beginning? There are no additional continued public comments. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate Yes. Go ahead, Hassan. I uh, just for you and the members, uh, do, do you want um, to give you an update in, on the what the forecast for the sales tax, uh, or do you want to just do it with the budget next time? I think with the budget next time, uh, unless anybody has any uh, different thoughts on that. Uh, let's plan with the budget next time. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, hanging in there with this uh, unusual meeting. Next meeting is April 10th at 10 a.m. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>